link to uh, to a friend? Yeah. 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 Let me just try to get the chat window. Okay. Yeah. Send that to right. me now. Hold yeah. It. So it is just YouTube is just uh, loading now. Okay. Cool. Now we are live on YouTube, and I am going to start a countdown timer to set it for nine minutes, and then when the countdown timer is zero, that's when we start the talk. Okay, so I'm going to mute everyone Skip. and switch off video. Do you, as well. do, you, do you see the link on chat, Skip? Uh, let me check. Uh, probably. Yeah. So yes. Chat. Thank okay. you. That's it. Cool. I'm muting everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Yeah. Okay. You guys see are you super minutes. organized. That's great. <laughs> We've yeah. been doing it for a while now. Yeah. Okay. See you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.
Hello. Uh, good morning. Hi, good morning, uh, okay. good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Today um, is the next seminar in this Frontier series that we've been organizing for the last few weeks. I'm very happy to introduce Professor Albert Skip Rizzo. He's going to talk on virtual reality exposure therapy for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. He is director for medical virtual reality at the Institute for Creative Technologies at University of Southern California. He's also a research professor at USC Davis School of Gerontology and USC Keck School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He's been very well known for a long time, maybe nearly two decades, for his research in virtual reality in the area of um, clinical psychology. So he conducts research on design and development evaluation of virtual reality systems, particularly targeting clinical assessment and treatment. Uh, his work using virtual reality exposure therapy for PTSD received the American Psychological Association's Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Treatment of Trauma. He is currently working on artificial intelligent virtual patients that cl clinicians can use to practice skills for their challenging clinical interviews and diagnostic ass assessments. He's also working on uh, training emotional coping skills with the aim of preparing service members for the stresses of combat. combat. Uh, he's creator of virtual reality mental health email listserv called VR Psych, which at least I use through Facebook. Um, and also he's the editor in Frontiers in Virtual Reality, he's the editor of the section on virtual reality in medicine. So I'm very happy to introduce him and now over to Skip. Okay, thank you, Mel. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to present today. Um, I'm assuming everybody is uh, safe and well surviving COVID. And uh, hopefully this will be a one hour diversion from the everyday experience you're having. Uh, and hopefully it'll be interesting for you. <laughs> so let me uh, share my screen here and get started. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see this and that um, if not, someone will let me know. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm gonna talk about virtual reality goes to war, but it's really about um, a review of the, the history of our work, uh, designing virtual reality systems to address the needs of service members who've been exposed to extreme trauma uh, from combat. And now uh, the expansion of that work to other sources of trauma and to the civilian sector. Uh, so, with that, uh, a really quick outline of what I'll try to cover in the next hour is a quick introduction to clinical VR and virtual reality. I'm sure most people are familiar, but we'll get everybody up to speed on that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about exposure therapy and the roots of this field, uh, addressing phobia and other anxiety disorders leading into its application for PTSD. We'll talk about some of the other PTSD related projects that are focused on assessment and also uh, spend a little bit of time on uh, an experimental approach towards using virtual reality to help prevent PTS uh, in service members, but something that be generally transferable to anybody that works in a high stress occupation. Um, Hopefully I'll have some time to talk about the future as well. So with that, um, our work uh, is done at the Institute for Creative Technologies at the University of Southern California within what we call the Medical Virtual Reality Lab or MedVR. And since 1996, when we got started, um, we've addressed psychological, cognitive, motor, and virtual human issues in the clinical space. And I'm going to show some little video clips of some examples of that work over the years. Um, so on the psych front, relevant to the discussion today, this is a quick short video on what you'll be seeing more of with a virtual Iraq or virtual Afghanistan scenario. <laughs>
Oh. So? Hey, Rashida. Assalamu alaikum. Amrikayan Ragali. So you get the idea there. Um, I can't talk while the video is running because of the way uh, the Zoom links or YouTube link works. Um, but that's, uh, you know, if you were wearing a VR headset and turned your head, you would be in that scene on that foot patrol. This is what it looked like 10 years, so actually 13 years ago, when we took the original version have one minute to identify two targets. of the simulation and translated it into a test of cognitive function. This being a test of memory, uh, but we developed attention and executive function tasks all within a military relevant context to assess service members after mild traumatic brain injury in the combat environment. Uh, we don't just do uh, military work, of course. Uh, this is some very early work that we did. Uh, with 3D projection systems, studying visual spatial skills, specifically in this case, mental rotation. Um, this is a follow-up project looking at attention processes in children. Virtual classroom. I'll pause this for a second because I know uh, the, the audio interferes, but basically the child has to pay attention to what's going on on the blackboard, the wearing head mounted display, uh, but we can systematically present distractions in the classroom and not only measure how well they can attend and perform on the stimulus challenge, uh, but we can assess from the head mounted display and other sensors, their physical activity and movement and where they're looking, if they're looking out the window at a distractor and they miss a target, that would be more of a distractibility error as opposed to looking straight on at the board and missing a target, which would be a loss of focus. And this is from actually 2003, uh, but this now has been updated into a product. A number of other companies have kind of copied the idea, put out products, um, one group in Spain, uh, but now we have a company that is putting out a version modeled after this that uh, will soon be publicly available with a normative database. Oops. Let me go back to that. Here we go. We can see the classroom now. <laughs> okay. So you get the idea there. This is a physical therapy application, an older one. Uh, again, has been updated as you'll see later. Um, this is just basic, a basic range of motion activity using a Microsoft Connect type sensor, to track the user's movement, all with the effort to be able to deliver physical therapy in a way that's fun and engaging. And you know, when you look at physical therapy, it's a very boring, repetitive, and frustrating activity. So can we put it in a game context? And a lot of people, a lot of companies have uh, done this kind of work and have evolved it into products that are available now. I'm going to show a variation of this. Uh, and I won't be able to talk over the video, but it's a little girl with cerebral palsy uh, interacting with a similar type application where the connect sensor is tracking her movement. This is a, the, the project involved training or not training, but actually the cerebral palsy foundation wanting to make it so that kids with severe motor impairments uh, who couldn't operate a gamepad or a keyboard could still participate in computer games. And you'll see this little girl for the first time in her life actually playing a video game uh, by using her body as the interface by being able to use her, her, uh, a preserved movement of raising her arm, something she could do uh, quite volitionally um, to actuate the interface and make, as you'll see, the shark jump out of the water and grab the helicopter. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then finally, somewhat related to uh, the treatment of post-traumatic stress, but taking it from a different angle, training clinicians to be better clinicians in how they do clinical interviews and eventually in how they conduct therapy. The development of a virtual patient, the project we did, this one is from 2012, 
where we worked with the school social work at USC to build virtual patients to train uh, uh, social workers in training um, how to do a good clinical interview with a military veteran. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He was a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So I like to say that that gives novice clinicians a chance to um, screw up and learn from it with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. And then finally, Sim Coach. Um, this guy has been around since 2010. All of these projects have been updated and evolved to current standards. But in this case, it was to help uh, people who didn't want to talk to a live provider get information about PTSD and other wounds of war. And the character could also ask the user questions. And at some point, the character might say something like, it looks like you're really having some difficulties here. If you want, you can punch in your zip code and I'll pop up a list of providers in your local area. And I can talk to you if you'd like about what therapy would be to address the challenges that you're facing. I'll just let him introduce himself uh, now. Uh, we probably won't have time to cover any of the virtual human work today, but that'll be for another talk. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking, but I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Okay, so with that introduction to our work and uh, the plan ahead, let's just do a very quick intro uh, to virtual reality. And from a technologic or technocentric position, a combination of enabling technologies, computers, processing, interface technology, body tracking, sensory displays, all with the aim of putting people in controlled sim stimulus environments or simulations, either of the real world or of other worlds as relevant uh, for the purpose of the application. But I prefer the more HCI, uh, human computer interaction perspective, just simply making it so that people can interact more naturally with computers and complex data. Um, and if we look at the history of HCI, uh, on my classic slides here, uh, let's hope that virtual reality takes us past hunting and pecking on a keyboard and moves us towards interacting with computers and more sophisticated fashion. When we think about VR as a simulation technology for clinical purposes, uh, of course, the best metaphor is aviation simulation. So just as an aircraft simulator serves to test and train piloting ability under a range of controllable conditions, we can design virtual reality simulations to test, train, teach, and treat a wide range of human function under very controllable conditions. In some sense, if you're a student of psychology, you'll get this. Um, it's the ultimate Skinner box. Um, since 1994, when VR got its traction clinically, uh, it mainly was focused on specific phobias and some work on, on training of cognitive function, but the phobia work really got the best traction because it made so much sense um, the idea of exposing people, giving them opportunities to confront and reprocess, um, you know, their fears in a safe environment. Uh, but since 1994 to the current day, very fortunate that we've got at this point uh, a nice confluence of technology development, but basic science that supports applications across a wide range of clinical conditions. So, you know, when we started in 95, it was really the stone age. Incrementally, the technology got better. It really got a big bump around 2013, 14, um, came into its own. So now we're in a, a very nice position where the technology is caught up with the vision from the old days, but we also have uh, not fully mature literature, but we've got probably the largest uh, scientific literature of any virtual reality use case 
um, addressing these types of clinical conditions, either as a treatment or an assessment approach or a scientific study of these types of, uh, types of challenges that people face. When we talk about VR, it's good to look back and think about the three eyes, immersion, interactivity, and imagination. Some folks think virtual reality only involves uh, the use of immersive VR headsets. And I have a more liberal, progressive, or loose definition of, um, of virtual reality. So let's talk about immersion real quick. Here's an example of somebody in our PTSD scenario. We can get the point here. Here's a, an upper extremity application using a sensor to track hand movement and interact with objects using the leap motion sensor. A different company owns that technology now in some of our upper extremity games based around that concept. Okay, uh, now talking about interactivity, a little different. You don't always have to be immersed in a virtual world. So in this case, this user um, is shifting her weight side to side or leaning forward to drive this penguin down a ski slope, very low cost application an open source game that we converted. And you could easily see this being used as a balance training exercise with say an elderly person wearing a safety harness, of course, um, interacting, but it's obviously done in the lab on a big screen TV or in someone's home. It doesn't always have to be immersive to be a virtual, re an interactive virtual reality simulation. And it doesn't always have to be on a big screen either. Um, as you see here, if you build content that's interesting or compelling, people will use it even on a small laptop screen. Uh, we also think about interactivity when we talk about interaction with virtual agents. So this is an application we developed for uh, folks with the, with, on the autism spectrum, on the high end of the spectrum, to teach them job interviewing skills. Uh, we can manipulate, we can deliver this on a, a TV or a flat screen monitor on your laptop. Um, but basically various interviewers of various levels of provocativeness and different age, gender and ethnic backgrounds can uh, interview you and give you practice. And we've used this and published uh, data on its use with autism, but now it's expanded uh, towards disadvantaged youth, juvenile delinquents about to be released from incarceration, and of course, service members and veterans that are now looking for jobs in the civilian sector. Quick example, this is this character in this backdrop in the soft touch mode. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> in a minute, we'll get into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? Now you can change up the character and use a different backdrop and you can select the cranky mode. This is an entry level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. That said, what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? Okay, so that of course could be put into a VR headset and you can immerse the user in that context. But until everybody has a VR headset, when they finally become like toasters, you know, everybody has a VR headset in their home, might not use it every day, but they have one. Um, the better path, I think, for distribution is to go with a flat screen approach for these kinds of apps, uh, something that anybody can use anywhere. Um, many reasons why we use VR in this area. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these. If you have a, a deep interest in all the reasons why, uh, I'd suggest this paper that I wrote with uh, Sebastian Koenig, uh, came out the end of 2017. It goes through all the details on this. But for a shorthand viewpoint, you could say that VR offers five core assets, uh, generalized assets for applications in the clinical space. You can expose people to content that they might avoid normally in everyday life. You can distract people um, in ways that might be helpful for dealing with pain management. 
Uh, you can motivate people by integrating game type uh, applications into the mix to get them to do things that might be challenging otherwise. You can measure performance while somebody is engaged in these systematically controllable simulations. And hopefully you can engage people in content that they might not ordinarily engage with to learn things that they might ordinarily think are too hard or painful to, to learn. Um, and so today we're going to talk about ex the expose or exposure approach, uh, starting off with anxiety disorders and going into our work with PTSD. So in the beginning, there was exposure therapy. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is where VR initially got its uh, clinical traction and, uh, you know, first serious publications. Uh, um, and, you know, it made sense because the needs of an exposure-based model for addressing anxiety uh, and PTSD are well matched to what VR could do. The traditional method was to do it in imagination and gradually confront the thing that you fear. Some people aren't so good at that using their imagination in that way. So VR provides a way where a lot of times phobics would never go to the real place and expose themselves in reality or be able to conjure up the imagery in a way that would be therapeutically beneficial. So now we can put people in these simulations that they will actually do. And with repeated trials, you see a systematic decrease in the self-reported and measurable anxiety based on psychophysiological measurement as well. Um, so going back in history in 97, if you were in Spain at Christine Botella's lab and you had claustrophobia, they could put you in this environment, close the door on you and systematically move the wall in on you. Um, even though the graphics were relatively impoverished, um, good clinical results were found. And in the area of fear of heights, this was particularly noteworthy. This was an area where a number of folks did this kind of work. And um, um, really this slide is old because I didn't really need to update it. Most of the, all these studies listed here showed clinical improvements over a weightless control. Um, and the studies that follow uh, show a similar finding that uh, VR is an effective tool for using this. In some cases, the study shows just as good as imagination. Other cases, it shows uh, that it's better. Um, but perhaps one of the key elements to look at besides the efficacy, if it's at least as good as the best evidence-based approach, then maybe we have to consider that maybe more people will do do this kind of therapy in VR, the more drawn to it. We have evidence now to document that. Uh, so, you know, VR isn't just about the efficacy, although I think that's a powerful case to be made. Um, it's also about breaking down barriers to care. And so those studies I listed there, I stopped listing after 2002 because they became quite frankly redundant, um, but they're success stories. And again, going back to 1994, one of the first applications, uh, people were very critical back then because they'd say, what person is really going to be fooled into believing that this is really a fear of heights, you know, kind of an experience. Uh, but it turns out phobics, uh, people with these types of anxiety disorders, um, are very prone to reacting to these kinds of stimuli. Now, and they, and they actually did go into that environment and uh, show increased heart rate, sweaty palms, and self-report of real fear. And even people without phobias have that experience, particularly with some of the more modern applications, like in 2017, where, uh, you know, the technology got quite a bit better. And you see these kinds of uh, environments emerging uh, where, uh, and where people really feel like they're in that space and it can be delivered on a low-cost standalone headset. I like this one because you have to go rescue the cat or the little puppy. Uh, so it pits your fear of heights against your love of small furry animals. Also some work uh, being done at Oxford and was uh, published a while back, I think 20, yeah, 2018. Uh, Dan Freeman, I believe Mel has worked uh, on this project as well as one of the co-authors, but showing that maybe you can do some of this work in an, a self-help format uh, where uh, with a virtual agent or a character that can guide you through 
this type of exposure and cognitive processing approach to fear of heights, um, individuals that did this at home uh, showed equivalent outcomes to people that did it in the therapy office. Now, these folks were also uh, well screened and diagnosed. And um, I, I think we have to be very careful about make, pushing everything out the door to self help. We're not going to eliminate clinicians who inform a diagnosis. Uh, we can't have people just self diagnose and self treat. Um, that could lead to a lot of problems. So we have clinicians that do a proper diagnosis and use VR as a tool to extend the reach of their clinical care. Then we might might be onto something. Um, and so this paper showed documentation of that approach. Fear of flying, another area, this is back in 1997, what it looked like. Now, 20 years later, at that point, here's an application from a company in Spain, SIAS and what it looks like then. And uh, instead of needing, you know, six, $7,000 worth of equipment, you can do this on a $200 standalone VR headset. And, um, anyway, the, the future is here. Uh, now, if you look at the data, there's a number of um, meta-analyses and uh, I've got them, I think up to 2017. Uh, but here's uh, one that we did, another group did on 2008, documenting the value of VR exposure approaches. Uh, another meta-analysis updating it in 2012, similar findings. And 2015, uh, this group not only showing effectiveness of VR, but um, also that uh, what was learned in VR actually translated to real world behavior, which is the key element here. It's not just about have, helping someone to overcome their fears in VR. You want to see that it generalizes to everyday life. Um, last year, uh, in general, of anxiety disorders, a full issue came out that also um, has a, a meta-analysis on the field and a number of uh, use case studies uh, talking about uh, the value of VR uh, in the clinical area of treating anxiety disorders. Now, extending that work from anxiety disorders, uh, we go to post-traumatic stress, which follows a similar approach with an exposure-based behavioral model, helping people to confront and reprocess difficult emotional memories in a safe place and helping the anxiety reduction occur. But I think it's more than just a behavioral approach as I'll talk about as we move further. Let me just pause that for a second. Just the intro to that is uh, we're not the first people, obviously, to do this work. This is a collection of video clips of virtual Vietnam from 1998 that Barbara Rothbaum and Larry Hodges did, um, a driving simulation, um, a bus bombing scenario from Israel, um, a group in Portugal that did uh, another combat-related uh, simulation and uh, one and Joanne Defeaty and Hunter Hoffman's work with the Virtual World Trade Center application. I'll just run, let this run for a couple of seconds and give you an idea of what that content looked like. Okay, so why use VR? Well, you know, the intuitive explanation is uh, that it helps people to engage in things that they would ordinarily avoid. And when you look at uh, PTSD, one of the cardinal symptoms is avoidance. Uh, people avoid going to try to avoid going to places that remind them of what the, their trauma experience or try to avoid thinking about it, even though that's a very difficult thing to do. And so you're asking somebody in imagination to do the thing that they're well practiced for months and years and sometimes decades uh, to do the opposite of. So we believe that VR can engage people in their trauma memory in a way that can be therapeutic when done in the safety of a clinician's office with a good clinician that's well trained in this area. Uh, engagement here is fundamental. Now, and we got involved in this area in 2004, actually 2003, uh, with the idea 
and built off of a video game that you'll see in a second that was developed at USC, uh, had content available to us. But uh, we had a hard sell on this idea in 2003 and late 2004. <clears throat> it wasn't until this article came out, which was sort of a call to arms, that there was in fact a significant problem that people started to take, uh, take it seriously, take PTSD seriously. Uh, but also uh, showed an interest in virtual reality, even though it was at a time when virtual reality technology was still in a formative stage. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the data continue to show that it's a, still a significant issue over time. Um, more recent data has shown there's still untreated PTSD in the US service member population, veteran population, which is a shame. Uh, because it is a treatable condition. A lot of times you hear people say, oh, I'll never get over my PTSD. I'll always just manage it. I don't think, I don't think that's correct. I think that's a, uh, that sells short uh, the value that not only prolonged exposure, but cognitive processing therapy and EMDR may have. It's a matter of finding the right treatment for the right person. And VR may be part of that, but the traditional method may be more appealing to some folks. The data say otherwise, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so we started off um, taking some content that was available for this a game called Full Spectrum Warrior, developed for the Army. Um, we didn't have any funding, so we just ripped off a street out of the game, uh, the street in the middle at the bottom here, and we built a prototype to show off the concept, and this is what that looked like. And as we move through the prototype, I'll click buttons that add elements of sound and gunfire and, and 3D graphic action into the scene. That was part of the, the, the prototype approach was that the clinician would actually pace the exposure based on the patient's narrative <clears throat> and help construct the trauma narrative. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, in a way that um, the patient can go through it confront, reprocess difficult emotional memories, but at a pace they can handle. This is what it looked like, very primitive, of course, back then, um, 2004, click a button and have ambient sound. Another button for gunfire. By going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that we've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left, but I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that we've done. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Atlanta. So we went from building, basically ripping off a street out of a game that looked like Afghanistan or Iraq and uh, evolved the system over three iterations to include 14 different diverse worlds that would be relevant um, so that anybody that comes in the door, we can pretty much put them in a context uh, that was relevant for their trauma experience. And we can pace that exposure. Um, now keep in mind, uh, again, I want to underscore a well-trained clinician delivers this. The technology is cool as it might look, um, it doesn't fix anyone. It's a uh, it's a tool that extends the skills of a well-trained clinician in this area. And the way they do that is through a Wizard of Oz control panel. And this is from uh, the first application, the first clinical application, where you could put people in different environments and you could monitor what they saw, 
monitor their physiology and introduce stimuli as relevant to the trauma narrative that the patient is presenting to you. This is the second version. Uh, this is what the control panel looks like now, quite a bit involved, uh, but learnable, and a separate screen for viewing what the patient is seeing while they're going through uh, the simulation and narrating their experience. <clears throat> We've also gone multi-sensory right from the get-go. We incorporated a very expensive scent machine in the beginning of the application. Uh, we use physical props. Uh, we run the sound through subwoofers so that the user gets the experience of a tactile feedback experience. Uh, driving in the Humvee, they feel the vibration of the motor, the explosion goes off, they can feel it. Of course, the clinician can control uh, the level of that, so it might not even come into play in the very beginning, but may gradually get boosted. Some of the newer things that we've been doing is working with a company called OVR, uh, Olfactory VR Technology, and they built a very low cost 12 cent delivery system that can mount under a VR headset that's going to be available as a product over the next month or two. Uh, we were also playing around with navigational devices uh, with our colleagues in, um, in Norway and in Denmark. Uh, our traditional method was to use a gamepad and a, and a physical prop, a non-fireable gun. There's no f shooting in this uh, context, but holding the prop was relevant. And we got that initially from our user-centered feedback that a gamepad was okay for driving a Humvee or an MRAP or a vehicle but it was unnatural and distracting when you're on a foot patrol where you'd always have a weapon in your hand. Uh, so that physical prop aided, but we also are now experimenting to see if more embodied physical action uh, by way of an omnidirectional treadmill, and this is the Cyberit system. Uh, and I believe this thing goes for about 10 grand. It's probably not gonna uh, be in every clinician's office, but we're using it in our research to take a look and see if the actual physical act of walking in these environments boosts engagement and leads to better clinical outcomes. And of course, studying it for other purposes. Now, looking at some of the data, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough. Um, this was from the first, uh, very first uh, open clinical trial, first 20 treatment completers, people who uh, we got in our study because they didn't benefit from having received an already evidence based approach, but they did quite well in our application. This is at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego and at Camp Pendleton. First 20 completers, average 11 sessions, pre, post, and three month follow-up on the PCL checklist. Um, <clears throat> put a finer point on it, 16 no longer met PTS criteria at the end of treatment, four did not benefit. So that was encouraging and it spurred our work on further. Uh, more recently, this is uh, a little bit different approach using our technology, but integrated in a more comprehensive uh, treatment regimen. Uh, this is Deborah Bidel's work at University of Central Florida, where um, it's an intensive treatment. Instead of stretching it out over say 10, 11, 12 sessions over that period of weeks, uh, these folks fly into Orlando, uh, stay in a hotel for three weeks. Every morning they do the VR exposure. Um, in the afternoon, they do a combination of other types of psychotherapies that are customized to their needs, whether it's anger management or addiction or group therapy, or a wide variety of areas uh, contained in what's called trauma management therapy. And you see rather significant effect size uh, pre to post with this approach. And uh, a number of other groups now are looking more into this intensive approach, which I think is important. Uh, maybe we need to look at Post, treating post-traumatic stress with the same level of intensity that we look at other clinical conditions. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, it's, it's hard medicine for a hard problem, uh, but, you know, anybody who's gone through cancer treatment, you know, nobody likes the diagnosis, nobody likes the treatment, but you do it because you want to get better. Well, it may be the same thing with PTS, that maybe we need to treat it intensively uh, when it manifests itself. Uh, three weeks isn't a long period of time if it's feasible for someone to do that, uh, considering the benefits that they may get for the next 30, 40, 60 years. Um, 
Barbara Rothbaum's group also uh, did a study and followed people over a year post-treatment and showing that the gains actually continue to uh, improve. Uh, the rationale here is that um, once you get someone uh, through the initial phases of treatment, that they begin to become more engaged in everyday life and they start going to places that they typically avoided and finding out that uh, while similar environments in Iraq or Afghanistan might have posed a threat, those threats don't exist or hopefully don't exist uh, in your civilian life. Although the recent events in the world may say otherwise, but um, you know, the idea here is people continue to get better once you get them over the hump. Um, and in that study as well, up to six months, they showed decreases in physiologically measured startle response in a controlled paradigm. Uh, that the, my colleagues have developed uh, for this as well. Cortisol reactivity uh, was attenuated over the same time period. Um, a randomized controlled trial that Greg Rieger did with our original clinical version that only had four scenarios, uh, our first clinical uh, treatment version and was rather limited, showed equivalence to uh, traditional prolonged exposure, uh, the best considered to be one of the top evidence-based approaches, um, but the prolonged exposure outperformed VR at the three and six month follow-up, even though um, the changes uh, were not significant in terms of the loss of treatment efficacy at that time. More recently, um, I can just, this is, this is under review. This paper is the actual clinical trial. It's a, a randomized controlled trial, multi-site trial that's done over five years. Um, and this paper just uh, delineates, this is published, delineates the, the actual protocol. The actual results are under review, so I can't go into any detail other than to say that um, not only did we find VR on par with traditional exposure, but we found um, differential benefits for people who had comorbid depression. So for example, people um, that and it is a common condition with people that have PTS, people with PTS and depression uh, got a better clinical outcome uh, using VR than the imaginal approach. And that makes intuitive sense because your uh, people that are depressed often have a very difficult time engaging in therapy and therapy like this. Um, and so this may be where we go next in our science is to start to understand uh, the complexity of various clinical conditions and not just look at it like a textbook um, definition of PTSD, but looking at a more comprehensive picture. And, you know, again, VR may be the right call for some people. Maybe it's not. One of the key things is when patients feel that they have empowerment to participate in decision-making about their treatment, they typically do better. Uh, and so giving users or patients uh, a little more choice and more options in that choice may be a more effective way to go. And VR is one of those options. Um, we also expanded the work to address military sexual trauma because of the difficult nature of, of um, PTS related to this. We uh, had to do a very small safety and feasibility trial, but the outcome of that actually turned out quite quite uh, positive and it's spurring on future research in this area. Um, you know, it, it's a lot different uh, than, uh, you know, having a clinician hit a button and have a bomb go off or a helicopter fly over. Um, you know, in this case, we're not recreating sexual traumas, but we're, cre we're recreating the conditions under which these things may have occurred and helping the patient again to confront and reprocess difficult emotional memories and the results from that study done at Emory University and Barbara Rothbaum's lab with a small sample, again, 11 treatment completers. This was published in uh, that 2019 Journal of Anxiety Disorders uh, special issue that I mentioned earlier. We saw positive gains that were maintained at three month follow-up. Um, and uh, even with a small sample, we saw good effect sizes, <clears throat> uh, not just on PTS uh, scales, but also on the depression scale. 
uh, PHQ-9. And we saw differences in physiological reactivity. This is preliminary pilot data. I wouldn't hang my hat on this too well. This data needs a, a deeper dive, but it points away that we may be able to get more objective measures of change in a clinical setting by looking at startle response or cortisol reactivity and so forth. So, you know, one of the key points with looking at this is, um, you know, maybe we need to reconceptualize therapy. Um, you know, we got to look at it and, and as a tool that, um, you know, maybe using VR may appeal to a generational cohort, to a digital generation of people who grew up familiar with this technology. We certainly know from that clinical trial I mentioned that is under review now, that when folks were asked at the beginning of the trial, while they were going through the informed consent period and they were described, it was both types of treatment, imaginal prolonged exposure and VR exposure was described to them that when we asked them a question at that point, if you had your pick, because you're gonna be randomized, but if you had your pick, what would you pick? Almost 77% um, chose VR. So um, that's pretty significant data to make a case for the preference of it. Now, other work has been done. I'm just gonna mention it briefly because I wanna to get to the pre-treatment, I mean, pre-deployment resilience training and spend a little time on that. Um, you know, we've done a, a variety of uh, projects looking at um, functional MRI before and after treatment, showing positive gains in activation uh, of different areas of the brain thought to subsume the uh, PTSD response. We've done a number of studies, some I've mentioned already, uh, looking at physiological reactivity and recovery time, um, showing that VR may be a, a very useful tool for assessment of PTS. Um, we've expanded our work to build out content with a little bit more blood and guts, um, in some cases, um, for addressing the needs of combat medics and corpsmen to make it more credible to their experience in the uh, in the main version of the system, we don't have a lot of blood and guts. We don't feel we want to habituate people to things they should have a reaction to. Um, and I, we don't think it's necessary uh, to get all gory on them. Uh, but with combat medics and corpsmen, it may be useful to have a little bit more. We built a Canadian version of the software, different vehicles, um, different uniforms and so forth. Um, you know, we, Different armies have different uh, needs to make the simulations more relevant. Now, this is what I'm really interested in, and we've got a number of proposals under review to advance this work beyond the original uh, application. But the goal here is to put ourselves out of a job on the back end, treating PTS by doing a better job on the front end, uh, preparing people for the stresses of their occupation, in this case, combat. Uh, so in the United States around 2010, there was an increased interest in this area um, because we were seeing that many people were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with significant psychological health problems. Um, and so the concept of comprehensive soldier fitness, which was non-VR, it was a training, you know, death by PowerPoint approach. Um, and basically psych fitness recognized every bit as important as physical fitness. That's the big take home that the military graduated to recognizing that. And that maybe a better job is to go from treatment centric to prevention enhancement of psychological strengths, not building universal soldier, cold killer people. That's often times what people take away from this. It's more about teaching people coping skills to deal with the, the horrible things that they have to face in a combat environment. It's not an endorsement of war, which I'm pretty firm, firmly set against as a solution for conflict. But, uh, you know, when those times happen, uh, you know, I think we have to uh, do our best job to help folks uh, cope with it and not come back broken. Um, so our approach was to use immersive narrative, but I want to talk about some of the approaches before where it's passive. So this is an application that was basically a graphic novel. It was developed to engage people with a story about 
a squad of combat medics and, and uh, corpsmen as they went through a whole saga with multiple deployments. And, and it was pretty graphic at some points and so on. It was designed to engage people in uh, the story, but also in the realistic you know, things that might happen to them. Um, the people that built this also built a video version, which is available on YouTube, where they, they actually filmed the static imagery and modified some of it and added an oral narration and some 3D graphics to the mix. And I'll just show a little bit of that clip to give you an idea. But keep in mind, it's still observational narrative. People are not interacting with it. They're observing it. <clears throat> well, gentlemen, this is home for the foreseeable future. All right, CBs, get your gear stashed and muster out here at 10 mics. Go, go, Sergeant. Let's go, Bees. You heard him. Great to be back, huh, Wallace? Yeah. Man, it's just like it was yesterday. Incoming! Ah! Hit the deck! So that section um, illustrates the idea of a flashback uh, following pre-deployment of bad experience that person went through. It, it gets more involved as you follow this whole story. Um, another group basically used a software tool called Virtual Battle Space that the US Army uh, licensed for a period of time. Um, I think they still use it um, to create, again, stories about things, but passive observation. So this, what you're gonna see, could have been done with actors. But now they can, you can build it in a VR simulation and not have to hire actors and all the costs for a big production, although there is significant cost for building this. So let me let this play for a second, keeping in mind it's passive observation. After sweeping the road and finding no IEDs for over a click, the squad leader put his men in a tactical column on the road and headed back to the cop. On the way back, an IED was initiated by an insurgent hiding in a field adjacent to the dirt road. One Marine was killed, five Marines and an interpreter were wounded. The rest were unscathed. Okay, so uh, I'm seeing I've got about seven minutes here. So let me move forward with what we did in this area. And basically our view was to build immersive interactive narratives to leverage the content that we'd already built, the art content we'd already built uh, for the treatment approach. And to use that, those settings as actual like filmable settings, which we could put users immersed in a story. So instead of watching Band of Brothers or whatever war movie or series on TV, just observing it, you're in the episode, you're with the squad, you get to know the characters. And as you go through this, certain things happen at the end of a five to seven minute mission episode that are based on the experiences of people that have, that have PTSD and what they talk about therapy. Vehicle three. IED, drive, man. Go, go. This, this is vehicle three. Go, we just go, got hit. Go. We're down. We're down. Oh my God. So at the end of each episode, something bad happens. So you can look at it like an emotional obstacle course. Um, but we don't just stop there. It's not just about exposing people to what they may face. You want to teach them something to be able to cope with it. So, um, you know, looking at comprehensive soldier fitness and other programs that have been developed to do this, we've taken those kind of well-vetted approaches and embedded them so that at the end of when the bad thing happens in the episode, a virtual human mentor walks out into the scene and then engages you in a dialogue about what you experienced, does deliver some psychoeducation, some specific tactics to the content. So we do that with a virtual human and I'll just walk you through some slices of how you, how the, the character would begin to deal with uh, your experience following being hit with an IED in a, in a Humvee experience. Let's start with learning how your body reacts to stress. The caveman part of your brain, the amygdala, goes into action. 
Its job is to identify threats. If the crap you're in is real, the caveman starts beating his drums, sending signals throughout your body, telling it to get ready. I worked with a sergeant who stayed amped after serious encounters, sometimes for days. Not good. When you get a chance to lower your guard, you want to make sure you help your body recover from the stress response that was initiated. One way of doing this is through a simple breathing exercise. It can help calm your heart, normalize your breathing, decrease blood pressure, and help you sleep. Let's try it a couple more times. Breathe in silently through your nose, deep into your belly. Now slowly exhale from your mouth. Let me hear it. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through the, um, I was gonna show a couple of other episodes that deal with death and dying, the death of an inspirational leader, and then uh, the next day at the forward operating base where people uh, on the squad are grieving um, and they're exhibiting different levels or different stages of the grieving process. Um, but keep in mind that generally we're trying to put people in context where they experience the kinds of things they may experience in war and give them the tools to better cope with it. So I'm gonna skip through this. Here's and, uh, uh, you know, we look at this as a way to build resilience, but it's also a tool that can be used to assess resilience perhaps. And that's a longer term research project to study the physiological reactivity and recovery times of people when exposed to this content. Uh, we've done some pilot work with ROTC students uh, that had never been deployed, showing that the pivotal point in the simulations did have an effect on heart rate variability in five of the, um, of the four of the five scenarios tested. Um, that paper is under review, right? Oh, it's in press now, that's right. Um, we also got good service member buy-in when embedded within a larger resilience program. Um, we, got, we had service members rate their experience, which is very important to get user buy-in. You know, if they think it's just a stupid video game, you know, they're gonna be less, maybe they'll be engaged with it, but not for the purpose. But as you can see from these various ratings, we got high buy-in on the content here. Um, and our vision is to look at giving every service member um, a headset, uh, preloaded with this content. Now, of course, with the Quest, which is a pretty sophisticated device, we believe we can put this kind of content in a standalone so that when you go into the military, your first day you get requisitioned your helmet, your backpack, your gun, and here's your Oculus Quest or whatever, Pico Neo, whatever uh, device uh, preloaded with this content. Oculus. You guys know what the Quest is. So I'm like, I'm gonna skip over this and get to the final part of the talk here, war sucks, but it does drive advances in, of course, medicine. If you look at the wound to kill ratios over different wars, you know, uh, certainly emergency medicine and civilian sector has benefited from what's been learned in the horrific wounds that combat medics and, and military medicine people have to deal with. But there's also a case to be made for psychiatry, psychology, neuropsychology, and rehabilitation. Um, you know, and it's not an endorsement of war, but rather if there's anything we can get out of it, let's take a look. World War I drove the civilian IQ testing movement with the Army Alpha Beta and led to advances in neuropsychological assessment. The birth of psychology as a clinical profession, clinical psychology occurred after World War II when psychiatry was overrun uh, with too many people uh, coming back with battle fatigue or shell shock, whatever they called it back then. So the VA Veterans Affairs uh, Hospital set up uh, an internship program to train PhD psychologists trained in assessment and research in the clinical arts. Um, and the National Institute of Mental Health was formed basically by an executive order by Harry Truman in 1947 to address combat neurosis. Of course, the mission has expanded. Other examples show war, um, as a driver for advances in these areas. And uh, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan are no different. I think it has driven a wider acceptance of the use of technology in clinical care, certainly. Um, and that is going to lead to 
better civilian translation. Now that we have research and we have lower cost and, and highly usable and credible systems built, there's certainly enough trauma in the world. So if you look at first responders uh, and police, firefighters, medics in everyday life, you know, they may benefit from this kind of training. We're working with a group doing a project with de-escalation training for police officers, something very relevant to considering what's going on in the United States now. Um, to train officers how to de-escalate a situation rather than to amplify it and cause more problems. Uh, we're working with both LA and New York City police on that. Here's what that looks like. Basically, the character is very provocative in all these settings. I'm just going to show one little part. What's going on? Why are you here? My name is none of your damn business. No, fuck you. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, but the, the goal there was to make characters uh, that were really provocative to provoke police officers and teach them better ways of de-escalating the situation. But it's not just police officers. If you look at the nurse population, this is using data from 2014, published in 2019. You see that, um, you know, female nurses uh, show significantly higher rates of suicide than civilians, civilian females, and the same thing with males. You also see this from a 19, uh, 2019 um, meta-analysis with physicians, higher suicide rate with females also having a higher rate than the males. And moving to our current situation with COVID, you know, or this was a study from uh, a group in China looking at healthcare providers and showing depression, anxiety, insomnia, and distress being over baseline levels and a high percent. Um, also, um, this was a recent study published on actual PTS in COVID survivors. And look at these numbers here. I mean, and this is not a small sample. Um, so we, we have uh, equivalent to 2004, 2005, wartime wounds of war trauma experiences, I think we're going to be facing that now uh, as we move forward. And there's a big opening uh, for VR. We're about to put, and I'll put this on social media, a link to an online survey to document mental health and wellness that we're trying to get a handle on the incidence of this. Uh, it was just approved by the IRB on Friday, and we're doing the final cleaning up of the, uh, uh, the survey. Uh, based on their recommendations, but that'll be out the next day or so. You'll see an announcement if you can take the 10 minutes it takes to fill it up. We'd all appreciate that and try to study the impact of COVID on mental health and wellness. And one of our, uh, our proposals under review is a cross-platform approach to address those issues uh, using web-based, mobile, and VR content as we move forward. So to conclude, um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's a number of benefits for using VR. I think we're going to see the standalone headset really drive penetration. Uh, if you're interested in more information, this is an article in European Journal of Psychotraumatology uh, from 2018 that reviews a lot of the stuff I've talked about. And I want to thank some of our sponsors, uh, in addition to the Department of Defense that's funded the initial work. but commercial entities that have helped support the work and especially um, Soldier Strong, which is a foundation that now is providing free equipment to any VA that wants to implement this treatment. And since December, we got kind of sidetracked with COVID, but since December, uh, we have, actually this only shows 13, we have 16 sites that they've donated equipment and trained clinicians in its operation. So theoretically informed, scientifically supported, Low cost, high fidelity technology available in a passionate development community. All good things, but you know, can we also break down barriers to care? Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop and take questions. I'm sorry if I went a little bit over. Uh, I still have a lot more stuff I could talk about, but we only had one hour today. So thank you for your time and attention and I'm ready to take questions. 
Thank you very much, Skip, for such an important area. I think uh, you could have gone on for a longer time and it would have been very worthwhile. And as you said, I think the applications of virtual reality and various kinds of uh, clinical rehabilitation on the psychology side, the mental side, has been probably one of the biggest areas of research of applications in virtual reality in the last 20 years. So thanks very much. Uh, there's been several questions come in, if I can find them. The first one is from Carlos Maranez, who says, a nice talk. Uh, when training, talking with virtual avatars, like a job interview or a coach, if the user expects an answer and it doesn't sound human, does it ruin the, the immersion? That's a very good question. And Mel, I'm sure you've uh, gone through the same kind of thing with your uh, great work uh, implementing virtual humans as well. Um, and that harkens to the, the idea of the uncanny valley that came up with robotics. And I think it's a little bit different with computer graphics. Uh, with robotics, you have a physical entity and the closer it uh, gets to being kind of like human, but still not quite there, people get a little bit creeped out by it. Um, certainly, if you build a bad virtual human interaction, uh, people are gonna you know, not take it as credible and uh, lose interest in a hurry. Uh, so natural language processing is essential uh, to do good natural language processing. And in these kind of applications, it's really good if you can have a constrained domain so that you know, if a user is interacting with a virtual agent um, around a job interview or a clinical condition or um, training, you know, for motivational interviewing, an area that we've gotten some good results with. Um, you can limit the verbal interaction to the topic area. Uh, certainly, when somebody's interacting with an agent uh, for a healthcare purpose, they're not going to randomly say, oh, who do you think is going to win uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, football World Cup next year or whatever. Um, although we do try to anticipate some of those hairbrain questions and, and build in some kind of a, a response. But uh, your question is very important because understanding the user group, what their needs are, and what the direction that you want to have them go is essential in building quality uh, virtual human interactions and we still have a long way to go with that but it's going to get better the technology is in place uh, to evolve this it's not going to just get worse over time it's i think it's going to get better but then we have the ethical concerns that we need to be uh, focused on in parallel thanks very much um several people have commented on the fact that you've shown quite a large number of different scenarios and assets and so on and uh, Vinaya Gamorfi and hello hello Vinoba uh, she asks has the community started sharing virtual environment assets so that people don't have to build worlds each time they want to run these kind of studies I think that's a, a larger VR community project if you will um, you know I, I think it makes total sense uh, uh, why reinvent the wheel when something's already been created. Keep in mind that it's not a cut and paste job, taking one person's application and just changing it up very easily. There is a development cost uh, for changing up a world to provide the interaction content and the specific direction that you wanna go. Uh, you know, you're always gonna have to have some resources to modify it, but if you can eliminate the cost of actually building the space, um, that that makes total sense. So maybe that's a uh, that's an e a good EU project to build a library of standardized worlds that anybody can access. I know Giuseppe Riva tried doing that way back with what he called Neuro VR, but it was a very very basic tool. But you know it was a good thought, a good effort early on, and uh, we should be able to do this in the clinical space. It would be it would it would speed up the capacity to do research, particularly with graduate students that want to do a master's thesis or dissertation, but simply don't have the time or the resources to build out their vision. You could take a section from virtual Iraq and virtual Afghanistan and use it 
we would love that. So contact me if you want to do that. We would share that kind of content for research purposes, certainly. Thanks. And um, William Charles wants to know whether you have any thoughts on the work of Dr. Patrick Bordnick's MSW program. This is to do with uh, addictions and so on. Uh, Patrick has been kicking around for a long time, and he's now the Dean of Social Work at Tulane University and continuing his research on what we call Q exposure. I didn't have time to go into that, obviously, um, but it, it follows a behavioral model of taking people that are addicted and putting them in contexts that activate their urge state. But when they're in a the real world context of the therapy office, they can't follow up with the urge with lighting up or drinking, whatever the substance is. So the concept is to break the behavioral cycle of cues in the environment that induce an urge state and resisting following up on that urge state with consumatory behavior and break that behavioral reinforcement schedule for addiction. Addiction is way more complex than just the behavioral approach, I personally believe. And so these same kinds of provocative environments that you can put people in may serve the role for relapse prevention training on a more cognitive level. So, you know, you're at a party and everybody's drinking, but you're not drinking. And some attractive member of the opposite sex comes up with a drink and go have a drink with me and everything. How do you practice how you might refuse that offer and still engage in a social conversation? That's the kind of work that Patrick does and it's to be applauded. And, uh, you know, he's been a leader in this field, really studying it from a scientific perspective, understanding the actual uh, effect of this content on inducing urges. And then how do you work with those, uh, those folks in that state in a clinical uh, space? He's doing some good work with opiate addiction right now. Thanks. Um, Ali Ajolu asks, do you believe that allowing the clinician, sorry, I'll start again. Do you believe that allowing the clinician to be co-present in the Iraq scenario via head mounted display with the client could potentially improve the clinician's ability to treat the PTSD? I, that's a good question. And that's an empirical question that we need to study. But my gut is telling me, and from anecdotal reports from clinicians and former patients. Um, a lot of times service members, when they go to a VA hospital, their therapist might be a first year intern who's never served in the military. And so there's always a, how, you know, what can you, how can you help me? What do you know about any of this stuff? Uh, is that kind of an attitude? It does not all the time, but it does come up. We've had patients Talk to clinicians say, I feel that you understand my situation better because you've co-constructed it with me and you've seen it and we've talked about it in context. So I take the, the other perspective that I think there's a value in that kind of a shared experience where the user is telling their story and the clinician's got to recreate the time of day or where the bomb went off or the number of people in the scenario. I think that could be a benefit for reducing that, that suspicion that the clinician doesn't know crap about what you went through. It, empirical question, great dissertation or great research study. Somebody's got funding, uh, I'd be more than happy to do that study. Thanks. Um, I think the next question you've kind of partially answered in re relation to Dr. Bordnick's work. It, uh, there's somebody anonymous who asks, does ICT plan to use VR as psychotherapy for other psychopathologies that are comorbid with anxiety, such as substance abuse? You know, sadly, um, it's not always the science that drives um, the work. It's the economics. It's who's going to fund you. Um, and we've applied for funding to do some of that work. Uh, not successfully, but I, I've partnered with Patrick on a number of projects and it's an area that I think is of, of real relevance uh, in our proposal for uh, the COVID work. Uh, we have uh, uh, a section on standalone VR headsets that can promote self-help um, and um, be able to send a headset home under the supervision of a clinician that has 
this kind of content uh, if it becomes relevant. Um, there's some ethical issues as well when it comes to addiction because you don't want to induce an urge state when somebody's at home, <laughs> you know, by putting them in the VR simulation. Um, so, you know, there's a delicate balance here, but at ICT, um, our work is open. Uh, you know, sometimes people say we're too scattered because we've addressed so many different clinical conditions in our work. You know, what is the unifying theme? You know, why don't you just work with kids with ADHD or we'll just work with vets and evolve that work. I say our direction is studying in a general way how people behave and interact in VR simulations that can have a good useful purpose or advance the science of clinical care. So that is the unifying theme across all these different areas that we've, we've worked in. Uh, we've done pain distraction work, you know, a couple of years back. We've done a lot of different things, but sadly, I hate to say this, but in the United States anyway, and probably most parts of the world, you know, it's, it's the money, it's where you get your funding uh, to do the work. And a lot of times some of the major funding agencies aren't gonna pay for innovation. They wanna pay for a clinical trial with something you've already created. A lot of times we have ideas to create something, to go to NIH, they don't wanna pay the development costs to create this stuff. They, they wanna pay for you to already, that take what you've already built and then run a, a, a well-structured clinical trial. So. These are some of the issues that uh, you face. Partnering with companies may be a direction to go where they've already built out content, but they need empirical evidence to support their content as a viable product. Because it's not like in the game industry where you build a cool game, people pay to play, you're a success. In healthcare, you have to have data. You have to have the, the, the you know, you have to be able to back up your claims. So companies, that are developing these things oftentimes have a need to partner with academic environments uh, to have an independent assessment of what they built and the outcomes from it. Now you're muted. Thanks. Are you okay for to answer a few more questions? Yeah. So this is from Robert Bellerman. He says, thank you for your presentation, Skip. Good to see you again. Uh, my question is, is there a danger in your opinion in the use of VR for therapy when it's used by non-trained people? Do you see this as a problem now that the technology is accessible to almost anyone? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we've written about this uh, uh, 15 years ago about you know, looking ahead into a crystal ball into the future when you could just go up online and punch in your clinical condition plus VR, and all of a sudden a bunch of self-help things pop up. Uh, you know, a clinician is essential for conferring a proper diagnosis and developing a treatment plan and monitoring that treatment plan. Uh, so Self-help, well, I'm a big fan because as we all know, World Health Organization put out stats of like 70% of people with mental health conditions never see the inside of a therapy office. Um, how do you get people to get the help that they need? In some ways, self-help, we see cognitive behavioral therapy delivered online showing good outcomes. Um, but with VR, you're dealing with uh, creating emotionally evocative settings that, you know, it, without proper supervision may not go the way you want. And of course, Hippocratic Oath, you know, which, which covers psychology as well, uh, you know, at first do no harm. Uh, we have to, and, and, you know, the IEEE has put out a number of good documents on uh, what they call ethically aligned design, um, where these topics are talked about, where you have to have the proper clinical training, and it derives from you know, like the APA guidelines, American Psychological Association and other psychological agencies around the world where you don't practice out of your area of trained expertise. That would be an ethical violation. So somebody that's trained in the clinical arts needs to be able to document that they're certified to deliver therapy. And with the PTSD exposure, that's an essential condition before we'll give 
the software to anyone. You have to have training in, in dealing with trauma. So a lot of issues here and they're important and they, they, the worst thing we can do is to uh, be capricious about this and throw this stuff out there, um, even if it's for a good purpose of breaking down barriers and getting people access. We have to be careful uh, because you know all it's gonna take is a couple of really bad cases and then all of a sudden everything we do uh, is under a horrific microscope. It's better to self-police than to have an external uh, group tell you what you can or can't do. Well, you know, the external group, of course, to set ethical guidelines, but uh, I think you get my point here. I hope. Yeah, thanks. And I think that that's really important uh, to make sure that the technology is not misused um, or used badly. Uh, so there's a, two questions, but they're but basically the same. One is that they're from Jordan Charles and someone else anonymous. Basically, they're asking what if they want to do this kind of work in the future, what kind of training should they themselves do? What kind of degree should they do this kind of thing? Two people have asked that. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think at a master's level, um, you can get applied training in clinical areas, certainly masters in social work, marriage and family counselors, so forth. Um, a lot of good, good training occurs in those programs. Um, uh, masters in clinical psychology, I, and I have a bias. I think that having a PhD is, you know, you, you really get in the kind of intensive training that you need and the supervision in your training. Uh, perhaps once we have a, a more comprehensive and better accessible virtual patient platform, people can train with virtual patients and get the supervision within a master's program. So I would say master's level is really the, is the entry point, optimally PhDs in, you know, in clinical areas, whether it's clinical psychology or, a or social work or occupational physical therapy, these kinds of areas. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, maybe there are, at a bachelor's level, there's technical implementation for some of these things, but I think you need to have it supervised by somebody that has a license that is certified, that well trained in the area. I mean, being ethically cautious here, uh, it, it's not like talking to your neighbor going to therapy. Uh, uh, there's quite a bit of training involved in being a good clinician, not just shooting from the hip. A lot of times I see that with people that are undertrained. You know, they're, just, they're, they're spouting opinions or giving advice. They're not doing much more than what you can get from your neighbor. Therapy is really a, a, an art and a science. I think you need to have proper training, especially when you're using a tool that can emotionally provoke people. You've got to be very, very thoughtful in this area. Thanks. Um Amy, someone with the appropriate name of Amy VR, uh, just makes a comment, which is she thanks you for including longitudinal follow-up because the community does it so rarely, and this should be included whenever possible. Uh, we shouldn't just focus on short-term effects. That's just a comment. Then um, Ewan Lavoie says, um, do you foresee the development of VR applications for nefarious purposes? to desensitize soldiers to the atrocities of war under the guise of psychological resilience? It could easily go that way. Uh, we have to be vigilant. Um, you know, again, going back to the ethics, um, I don't see that happening, hopefully in our work, uh, because our work is focused on setting up a context and then teaching um, a, a skill for managing emotion in a way that's directed towards uh, preventing a longer term psychological impact. Uh, we have a lot of, in our, our STRIVE project, uh, two of the scenarios, you could say three, but two of them are focused on moral injury and on moral relativism. Uh, one is where you come upon a group of men beating a woman um, and having to intervene in a certain way. Um, you know, there's a number of moral ethical issues. So I think we have to take a wider comprehensive approach to this. And certainly, 
you know, anything that you can design for a good purpose, somebody can get their hands on and tweak it and twist it and do it for a bad purpose. I know for a fact that there was a game in the early, um, early 2000s called Under Ash that was created in Syria that used Israel as the setting for, um, you know, and, and we're certainly the game industry has some responsibility here because they've oftentimes used stereotype characters from the Middle East as the enemies. And in this case, the, the Syrian game developer did the exact same thing, but the Israelis were the enemy. Now, I'm not going to get all into politics here because it's a very messy topic, but my case being that people have developed things that from your political or, or uh, you know, your political standpoint, you might find reprehensible for them. It's the same thing you're already doing. So an important issue to address. And again, this is where VR is, is a gift for us in a sense uh, for enhancing clinical care, but because of the power that we believe it can, it can deliver for a positive purpose, we've got to accept that in the wrong hands or with the wrong motives, it could be directed in a negative way that we've got to, we got to call out when we see it. Thank you. There's three more questions. Are you okay for this? Oh, good. Okay. So th this is Shu Wei. Hello, Shu. Uh, while some mental disorders can only, while some ment well, actually, I'll read the, the main part of the question. How do we pre measure the ethical and potential effect of your environments without informing the participants in advance? So this is related to ethical issues. We have to, I have the same problem in some of our studies that we have to inform people. It may happen, but if you do that, then it kind of destroys the effect. You know, this is, you know, why you have institutional review boards that, you know, review your protocol. I just went through a, a long process simply for an online survey because we're asking questions about self-harm and suicide. We had to actually build a suicide prevention plan as part of an online survey, so that if somebody endorsed a certain question, all of a sudden content would pop up that would provide them resources, hotlines, and so forth. That's why you have IRBs uh, to do that, help you to do a cost benefit analysis about when deception is ethically acceptable. And in some cases, you know, you, you don't reveal your, your hypothesis, of course, you tell somebody one thing and then it's incumbent upon you at the end to debrief the person and you just can't do it capriciously using deception. There's got to be a solid clinical or research scientific rationale that makes the case that the benefits of that research are worth, you know, what you're doing to the person. Um, and Mel, you've gone through this a bunch, you know, you've replicated some of the most controversial experiments in the past and, you know, it's, you know, you're spending as much time writing an IRB proposal, I'm sure, <clears throat> as yes, you exactly spent right. writing the proposal to get the funding. So good question. Uh, but again, there's not a clear cut answer other than the existing procedures and guidelines we have with um, ethical review boards. Thanks. So um, it's really the next question really illustrates how geographically widespread we are. This is from Maria Russo, who I know uh, she was at UCL with us and um, she's in Greece. And she asked, she says, the non photorealistic rendering approach of the graphic novel framed in a narrative is very interesting. Have you tested the effect of aesthetics in engagement and ultimately on the sense of presence? Um, we should, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, to be honest, a lot of times um, with clinical research in VR, funding levels are such that, you know, you, you try to build the best, most comprehensive, everything but the kitchen sink in there to show that this kind of an application has a clinical effect and effect on outcomes. And then the dismantling studies follow that if you can get the funding. Um, and certainly, you know, we use a scent machine, 
because we make the case that, you know, uh, you know, the olfactory bulb in the brain is connected, intimately connected with memory and emotion, and it's going to activate memories when we have the proper set delivered at the right time and all that. We don't have a lick of data to support that. We're just operating from theory. I would love to be able to do that study, just as I would love to do a study on the level of graphic fidelity needed. Uh, and some people are doing those studies, certainly. Um, but, you know, it's... It, it, it does boil down to funding. I mean, look at if, uh, you know, MacArthur Foundation is watching this, I would be happy to take one of those big fat awards where you can do whatever the heck you want. And those are the kind of things I would do. I would do the dismantling of, of this kind of work. But when you're working with patients, you, you've got to be, you got to be careful because you just can't use them as guinea pigs. A lot of times, you know, they're expecting a clinical outcome. And so if there's a way to go in there and document that your low fidelity graphics are effective. You can run that group and then maybe compare them with a higher fidelity application. And you can ethically get away with that with patients because your, your low fidelity thing has already been shown to have clinical efficacy and it's accepted. So these are important issues. And it, I mean, look at how, how many years has psychology been around, re, or experimental psychology um, as a scientific discipline, 100, 25, 50 years, whatever, studying human behavior and interaction in the real world. Well, maybe we can cut that time frame in half, studying human behavior and interaction in the virtual world. If we can do it in 70 years, um, but we still have a long way to go to do that. Uh, and, and the beauty of it is, unlike the real world, we can systematically control all these things. You can't control you know, the level of sunlight in an outdoor environment for a research thing. Um, you have to rely on experiments of nature, like what we're going through right now with COVID. That's an experiment of nature. You could never systematically manipulate that in the real world. It just happened, and now we have to study that. Same thing with VR. Uh, we, we have a power with VR to have a controlled stimulus environment. And, um, but we need to now study that because you have people of dual mind. They know in their frontal lobes, whatever, that they're in a simulation. <clears throat> but the perceptual stimuli presented may have a different effect, even if they know they're in a simulation, like on, when you walk a plank on a, on a high building and whatever, even people without fear of heights get a little shaky. That's their limbic system reacting to the perceptual stimuli of a big drop below you. Um, so back to the main point here, um, you know, I think it's an important area of research. There's tons and tons. There's no wall. That's why I got into VR in the first place, because I could see there was not going to be a wall I was going to hit in 20 years. It was just going to be incrementally growing, and we would be able to study better problems more in a more sophisticated way over time. I think, thanks. That I think the next kind of just answered, but I'll just say it anyway, in case there's uh, some additional information it see this is from max orozco who's who are who says it seems at various stages of the experiences there are modes of sensory stimulation is presence essential component of each stimulation how do you engage people in passive experiences you know mel you've dealt with this over the years as well it's a it's a hard area because it you got the measurement problem how do you measure presence? It's always going to be on self-report or is it on physiological reactivity or is it some behavior um, that you're measuring? Those are really three things you can measure in a human, what they tell you, what their behavior tells you and what their physiology tells you. Um, studying presence in these areas, I think is important, but the measurement is often fuzzy. So I can remember Hunter Hoffman doing a study um, with, I think it was an experimentally induced pain of putting a hot things on your foot while you're in an fMRI. And they found that when you were engaged in a VR environment, I think Snow World, that the self-reported pain dropped off, but the presence level had no impact on that. Um, you know, uh, so is that a measurement problem on how we quantify presence? Is it overwrought with 30 questions, the most common 
um, presence, or one of the most commonly cited presence measures, or a number of them, are a large number of questions asking about the interface and you know all these different things, or is it one or two questions? You know, and, and with those one or two questions, are efficient, but does it really capture the essence of presence? So that's a that's a basic science research area. If somebody can solve the problem, um, one way I've thought about it is, you know, do you measure how well somebody recalls the experience after the fact as a proxy for how present they were? If they were distracted or the environment was overly complex, maybe that would be a factor there. But it's, it's a I think it's really a measurement challenge that's held back. I mean, it's it's a great thing, immersive tendencies as well. Are there people that are are more primed um, to engage in a virtual environment based on a personality characteristic, introversion, extroversion, telling an absorption scale, immersive tendencies questionnaire. But these are hard questions to get, to get answers from self-report data. It can be done, but it's, it's, it's non-trivial. Thanks. I said there were three more, but actually there's one more, which I think you could answer quite fast, which says, um, has VR been used with people with dyslexia and is there um, any out that area? I think people have, I'm not up on that literature, um, but any way that maybe you can, uh, particularly with children, uh, tie in, I, I think Mike Mersenick did early work with this, but, I'm probably wrong on that, but um, you know, you, you've got the capacity to manipulate sensory stimuli in these various, whether it's in a VR headset or a big screen TV in an interactive format. And maybe there are ways that you you pair sounds with images or whatever. I'm I'm just not up on that area to give you an informed answer. So, uh, uh, thanks very much for giving your time on this. I know how exhausting this is from various points of view to be speaking in front of a screen for an hour and then a, another hour, a long time of questions. There is something from a, a comment from Ewan Lavoy, and I'm, I'm going to answer it because he says, how could I get involved in the development of VR ethics? So I'm just going to use that as an opportunity to announce that there'll be one extra session of this pro of this sequence of uh, of seminars and that's going to be on 24th of june where there'll be a panel discussing exactly this about vr ethics and the panel would include people from various different uh, companies and uh, and so on and it's based on a paper that was published not long ago so rather than bother uh skip with that question we would just come back on the 24th and you could we can talk about that so thanks Great. again very much. Uh, thank yeah. you. you can send me an email um, and I can forward, I've got the IEEE documents, uh, the two uh, ethically aligned design volumes, which are voluminous, um, but then a shorter concise version that just was put together recently. I can send that to anybody that has an interest in this area. And, and I have another- Can, can I say something? You know. Maybe Skip, Skip, you can uh, share that on the YouTube link as a comment, or I can include it in the description. So whoever watches the video afterwards can have access to that as well. Sure. Yeah. And there's a comment from someone else you know, from Abby Sanchez, and she says, thank you for a really good talk. So um, finally, to close, I want to thank, as usual, Dr. Sylvia Pan, who's behind the scenes doing the production to make sure everything works and it's always Great worked job. really well so far. Thank and you. just to say that the next talk is by Ronan Bulik on the 12th of June at three o'clock Brussels time, CEST, on ensuring self-presence through interaction in immersive virtual reality. So thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to stop the uh, live now.